Well, I have a way. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. I, I have no card on, on me. Maybe you can send me an email. Yeah, exactly. I will send you an email. Yeah, yeah. Looks like that's all we can get. Okay. Oh, well, it's better. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I think we should uh, we should start if we all agree. It seems to me that all the speakers are there. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, it's good. I appreciate that uh, we are uh, numerous around the table. So even that we have backbenchers, <laughs> uh, it would be uh, very good that we could start as soon as possible. I take it because because we I expect a lot of interaction. And that's also the reason why the speakers will have eight minutes for their own exposition and no more. Uh, and they will forgive me if I uh, uh, try to, to be sure that uh, we respect the eight minutes. And that will per permit us to have the, the most vivid exchange of views because experience has demonstrated that the, the great interest of this workshop is that we, we have a lot of exchanges and uh, various and, uh, and um, I would say, uh, interesting views that uh, we could all take advantage of. So uh, I mentioned only the fact that uh, when I look at the speakers, we will very much concentrate on the system, the financial, the economic and financial global system as a whole through very different angles of vision so that we would have a multi-ocular vision. Uh, and I, I take it that it is really the way to look at it because what we will address is a very, very impressively multi-dimensional concept. Uh, so I, I had uh, myself uh, written down a number of, uh, of uh, ideas or questions and I'm very happy to see that we will be able to respond to a number of those questions, uh, including the next possible crisis with the view that uh, uh, the likelihood uh, of a new systemic economic and financial crisis will be looked at with what, what would be the trigger, uh, if uh, any, what would be the likelihood of a, a global drama uh, of the kind of uh, what we had uh, experienced in the past. And I know that some of us are tranquil. I'm speaking of the speakers, others are very much on the side of those who trust that there is a probability that we will have a real major difficulty in the time to come. I am in that camp, I have to say personally, uh, for a, num a large number of reasons, including the level of global leverage that we see presently, but we can, uh, we never, do not agree all, of course, on that. We have also the impact of uh, the uh, Trump attitude, the Trump new uh, decisions, the trade, and uh, what exactly the trade will have, uh, as well as uh, geopolitical issues in general. So we are in a world which is extraordinarily dangerous, obviously, very new in many respects in the emerging economies as well as in the advanced economy with the rise of populism and the new I would say, uh, uh, threats and uh, challenges for globalization that are associated with, uh, with uh, populism. But without further ado, I would uh, uh, like to give the floor immediately to the first speaker, Yide uh, Kiao, on the multidimensional vulnerabilities precisely of the economic and financial system. So you have your eight minutes, sir, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chasher. Um, I, uh, I believe uh, any uh, economic uh, phenomenon, including financial vulnerability, occur not due to one single fact, rather than uh, multiple fact. Uh, so, uh, as moderator say, here I try to use. Uh, a multiple mention approach to uh, describe uh, what will happen in the next two or three years. Uh, in my mind, the first dimension is the possibility of uh, global uh, 
economic growth. Uh, we heard the news uh, the, the third quarter of this year, uh, U.S. growth rate reached 3.5 percent, which is very strong. But my feeling is the U.S. economy uh, now is approach its highest. It will um, uh, reach the turning point. The reason is when is a gas federal will continue to increase interest rate. At the same time, the debt ratio had been very high. So that means the company will pay uh, more cost for their financing. So, also the, uh, the tax cut, uh, the incentive uh, will be dramatically reduced uh, in two years or even disappear um, because uh, so far, I guess one trillion uh, US dollar come back from overseas, 50% uh, uh, will make investment. Another 50% uh, will be used to uh, purchase, uh, repurchase their stock uh, uh, share. At the same time, um, Chinese economy uh, under the great pressure of downside, uh, as I mentioned uh, uh, yesterday, uh, the third quarter uh, grow, uh, GDP growth is 6.5 percent. Uh, relative to other countries, uh, it uh, looks uh, okay, but it is the lowest uh, growth rate uh, since first quarter 2009. Uh, so the, in next uh, one or two years, I guess Chinese economy still will uh, uh, gradually uh, come down. Uh, so if you add the growth, uh, US and China, uh, which will occupy 50%, of uh, total gro uh, global growth. If these two largest economy uh, under the, uh, the going down phase of uh, economic uh, circle, uh, it will drag on the rest of the uh, of, uh, world economy. Uh, yesterday lunch, uh, Mr. Um, Branchard mentioned uh, Minsky. Actually, uh, earlier, the urban fisher in the um, 30s of last century have already found they do have a relation between the economic circle and the uh, uh, financial vulnerability. Uh, specifically, when the economy on the downside, uh, the financial vulnerability uh, will become bigger. So that's, uh, I guess, in the next two or three years, that's the time we should closely watch uh, what's happening in, in this regard. The second dimension uh, is um, about the uh, capital, uh, cross-border capital flow, uh, plus uh, debt ratio are very high. Uh, yesterday also Branchai mentioned the, 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 the global debt ratio already reach the same level uh, just uh, before the uh, global financial crisis. Uh, at the same time, I, I want to mention um, uh, the, the cross-border capital in terms of volume maybe not so high um, that before global financial crisis, but the structure of uh, cross-border capital flow uh, had been changing. Now, particularly among the developing countries, uh, capital, uh, cross-border uh, capital uh, went up uh, dramatically. Um, someone also mentioned um, uh, Adam Tooze uh, last year published a new book called uh, Crashed. He rightly pointed out so far too much attention had been to the current account balance uh, rather than to uh, cross-border capital flow. Um, particularly, he cited an example. During, um, uh, before uh, 
global uh, financial crisis, uh, people worry about the so-called uh, global saving uh, uh, gap, or people take care of capital from Eastern uh, Asia to US. Actually, he found the fact that the more capital between European and the US, uh, the, the volume is double of the, the capital from Asia to US. Although current account balance of European generally is okay, also almost balance current account of Europe uh, with the United States, but the capital flow is tremendously. So I guess it's very important we not only look at the uh, cap, uh, current account, even capital account, rather than we should take care of more growth uh, capital flow, uh, which uh, sometimes ignore the details of the capital flow. That will um, actually, gross capital flow will create some uh, the financial uh, problem. The last session I, I, in my mind that we should consider is, of course, many people have already uh, described the, the escalation of US-China uh, trade uh, war. Uh, I guess the longer the war dragon are, the bigger its negative impact, uh, not only to China and the US, but uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, as uh, Mr. Brandchild to mention, uh, the reduce of uh, trade balance is only one part of a uh, problem, one part of uh, negative impact. Also, he mentioned the inv investment. I can further to point out they have a chain reaction. After the reduction of investment, which will lead to the reduce of employ, uh, employment, then the national income will down, will reduce the consumption. That it's chain creation, uh, it's uh, will drag on the global financial, uh, global uh, 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 economic growth. Uh, so, uh, in my conclusion, I will say these three dimensions uh, will play some role, particularly these factors, if they uh, overlapping, uh, which will uh, create uh, economic and financial uh, problem down the road in the next two or three years. I stop here. Thank you very much. You were <laughs> fantastic, both in your exposition and respecting the Time limit. So thank you so much, Kiao. Uh, I turn to Jean-Claude Meyer, and I understand that you share part of the views which were just expressed. Please, you have the floor. Well, every forecast on the financial markets has been wrong. Therefore, I can give you my own views without any problem. <laughs> the question is, 10 years after the crisis, are we faced with a new financial systemic crisis or not? As we are at the end of an economic cycle, at the end of a sort of miracle. As a matter of fact, during the week of October 10th, stock markets have already had a severe correction, minus 7%. Nearly $3 trillion have been wiped off then. And since the beginning of the year, Shanghai stock market has already fallen by 40%. French stock market has, uh, has been decreased by 10% in October. At the same time, Nouriel Roubini among others, has just predicted a new financial crisis. Olivier Blanchard yesterday very brilliantly outlined his views, which are relatively optimistic. I'm less so, like Jean-Claude Trichet. Uh, probably because I prefer to be pessimistic and have a good surprise rather than being optimistic and have a thunderstorm. In fact, we can contemplate only, in my view, two scenarios. No optimistic scenarios, but just two, which are the following, a soft landing scenario or a severe financial crisis. A soft landing scenario could occur with three conditions. First, if Fed increases its, its rates only gradually, step by step, because inflation is moderate, around 2%, we could expect just a slowdown. Second, a sovereign debt default would not compulsory generate a systemic crisis as financing from IMF or banks could, 
could help and could avoid it. Third, the trade war uh, should not be as tough as anticipated, especially after the trade agreement with Canada and Mexico. And in that scenario, stock markets could stay nearly as they are in a sort of plateau or be lower by 10 to 20% in a very moderate way, of course, with a lot of volatility every day, which is the case right now, as a matter of fact. This is the ideal scenario which would make everybody quite happy. Unfortunately, on the other hand, a much less rosy scenario could lead us to a very deep financial crisis as many ingredients are there. There are six ingredients. First, we are at the end of a 10-year cycle, as we said, with low rates and economic growth, and we enter now in a new paradigm. Everybody shares this opinion, and this psychological impact has, uh, will have many effects. Geopolitical risks, as we see at this WPC, are huge. We have never uh, faced such an uncertainty, except maybe before uh, last, uh, last war. Stock market, particularly in the US, third reason, has so much increased, 330% since 10 years, but it can only fall down, particularly because earnings will decrease, because growth will decrease. The nine-year bull run is finished. Till now, it has been fueled by low interest rates, fiscal use stimulus, and a surge in share buyback, one trillion in 2018, which would decrease from now on. The problem now, which we face, is that the US stock market has has risen a lot, while the Japanese and European markets have not uh, risen at the same, at the same, uh, with the same, the same way. There is a divergence which we all know. So the fall of the markets will be more painful in Europe and in Japan. The irony of all that is that, uh, well, the fourth point is the trade war. The trade war will affect us could affect us a lot. It would affect the growth of the US, the growth of China, which we notice already, and the exporting emerging countries. Trump's trade war will, will raise the price of imports, leading to inflationary pressure, and as a, as a consequence, higher interest rates, stock market down, and thus creating a vicious circle. Again, the irony of all that is that Mao must have must laugh in his tomb because it's China which is threatening uh, capitalism. On top of that, confidence, which is key for growth and is needed by foreign investors, will reduce new investments as companies will wonder where to locate. And this uncertainty is exactly what market hates. Five in, uh, fifth ingredient, the debt burden, which we all know, has increased too much since 10 years. Uh, emerging debt market has been multiplied by four. China's, China's debt mark has been multiplied by, by five times in addition to his shadow banking problem. This debt has been fueled by low interest rates, huge liquidities coming from quantitative easing. Now that interest rates increase, major problem could arise, and, it, and, it, and in case a crisis, a crisis occurs, governments would have much less room for maneuver, particularly in the US where budget policy has been already used, which will restrict additional munitions when it will be needed by a recession. In fact, low interest rates have been very useful, but, have, but and, and high liquidity have put also the world at risk. A much bigger risk than the subprime crisis because the amounts are huge, and could come from state defaults. Six ingredient, interest rates. Interest rates will increase uh, by Fed. Uh, they have already increased a lot. Uh, eight rises since 2015. Once more till the end of the year, three times next year, in parallel with inflation because of a budget deficit due to tax cuts and therefore the need to attract hot money especially at a time when China is reluctant to buy treasury bills. 
the interest rates could rise much, bef much higher than expected. And there is the risk, the highest risk, because inflation would come higher. And particularly, we must not forget that oil prices, which are quite high, could, could become much higher in case of a war, in case of a problem in the Middle East. Because of this rise of interest rates and the dollar of, as a consequence, emerging countries are badly hit as their economies are dependent on foreign financing. And that would be very bad for the world growth because emerging countries are key for world growth, two thirds of the world growth. Growth will be reduced also as financing will be more costly and it will be harder to raise equity. Stock markets will slow down as yields of bonds will be higher than dividends and because of slower growth and increased financing cost. This rise of interest rates is done in a very bad timing as we all expect a slowdown of the economy and a fall of the stocks because of falling earnings due to a declining growth versus a huge pile of debt. In addition, nobody knows how the shrinkage of liquidities due to quantitative tightening will affect us. As we know, balance sheet of banks will shrink by $437 billion in 2019. In brief, we are very worried by the US situation, although booming now, as never, its growth will be reduced next year and maybe lead to a recession in 2020 and contaminate, as usual, the rest of the world. We all know that when US sneezes, everybody catches a cold. To conclude, we should remember what Hyman Minsky has called the paradox of tranquility. When things seem to go well, it means that crisis is roaring a severe crisis or a crack might, might occur. Everybody believes it could happen in 2020 or next year or later. Nobody knows when, of course. We should therefore be cautious and be very worried, especially as we all know that history is tragic. And as Cain said, we are all dead in, in the long run. Christine Lagarde just said in October, it's not just clouds on the horizon. It's a bit more than a drizzle. I would say that we are, in fact, in the fog, which is the worst thing for markets. Our only hope is that we will not see deep crisis, but just a correction, a soft landing scenario. Thank you very much. Well, you were quite asymmetric in your presentation with much more on the scenario two than scenario one, but you are catching up at the end <laughs> with your own wish. In any case, I think that Olivier should be prepared perhaps to intervene after having heard <laughs> all that and this very gloomy, uh, gloomy perspective, uh, you know, to, to rebalance a little bit. Anyway, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ida and, uh, and Jean-Claude. And I turn to Jeff with a view that uh, what we expect from you is your own, I would say, experience and uh, and uh, scientific research uh, in the domain of political economy, of uh, global economy, national and global economic and financial issues, and uh, with populism being present now uh, practically everywhere, including in the emerging world, which is new. Uh, you have a lot of things to tell us about. <laughs> Please, Jeff. Okay, well, thank you, Jean-Claude. Um, I will, you preempted me because I was going to start by saying I have plenty of opinions about the purely financial and economic issues that have been raised and, and others as well. But uh, as a political economist, I figured it would make sense for me to focus on the political. Finance is always political. We know that. There's a direct connection between politics on both ends and monetary and fiscal policy. But it's more general than that. The financial system is in, in, is in many ways a creature of uh, public policy and heavily affected by public policies. International finance is even more politically fraught than finance domestically, as we know from long standing, that is hundreds, maybe even many, many hundreds of years of conflicts over sovereign debts, uh, currently exchange rates. We just had a fascinating panel with Two of, two of the four uh, to my right and left, not geographical right and left, um, on, on some of the political issues that international financial and monetary affairs raise. The 
situation we face now is, as we all know, and which Jean-Claude has just referred to, that there is now a global backlash against globalization. We've been talking about a backlash against globalization, those of us in the area, scholars and observers, for 20 years because everybody knows that even if and when and, and as much as we believe that globalization is good for every country, we all know that there are winners and losers. And what we have found out is that this is what the globalization backlash is going to look like. We've seen it now in country after country around the world. And finance is directly or indirectly one of its central targets. I think we could focus on the narrowly construed problems of international finance, which are very interesting and very important. I think we will focus on them. That's fine. I'm interested in that. But I believe that the truly important challenges that international financial markets and national financial markets, and, and for that matter, national international economy more broadly, face are going to come from the evolving political circumstances, both domestic and international. Almost everywhere, among some substantial portion of the population, there is a very strong sense that globalization, including very prominently financial integration, has not helped them. And in fact, in many instances, has worked against, their, against them. There are different forms in different countries, different targets in different countries, different sources in different countries, different political expressions in different countries, driven both by differences among countries, of course, and the different national institutions and the situations they face. But just to give you some examples, in the Eurozone, there is tremendous resentment in the former, in the debtor countries of the periphery uh, about austerity. There's resentment in some of the creditor countries about transfers. There's resentment virtually everywhere about what has been seen as a series of bank bailouts, whether those were at the purely national level, as in some countries, or were implicated in or related to the Eurozone crisis. Or bank failures that threaten communities that those banks are found in. In a sense, Italy is the perfect storm here because the Lega is furious about transfers, Cinque Stelle is furious about austerity, and everybody in Italy is furious about the failure of Italian banks that, fa that, that, set, that threaten in one way or another, directly or indirectly, the savings of middle class households. So, so the Eurozone is, is clear in the sense that finance faces some serious political threats uh, there as well. And if those threats have not yet, as in, is the case in some countries, been made explicit, I believe they will. That finance is an easy target for those who resent austerity, resent bank bailouts, resent fiscal transfers, resent the, the attempt on the part of well-meaning bank regulators to close up banks that are insolvent. In the US, there is continued and growing resentment about job losses that are often related to the mobility of capital, both within the country and across, across borders. Donald Trump famously, during the campaign, in about half of his stump speeches, blamed Wall Street and financial markets for the offshoring of American jobs. He also, in well more than half of his speeches, blamed the existing political elites for bank bailouts that, as we all know, were a central part of the attempt to limit the effects of the, the crisis that began in December of 2007 and stretched out. Bank bailouts remain one of the least popular public policies in the last 30 years in the United States. In the emerging markets, Jean-Claude was just mentioning that the emer we've seen the emergence of populism in the emerging markets. I, I should say that, as Olivier mentioned last night, to some extent, this is a, uh, the populism in the 20th century was large, I should say populism in the 19th century was largely American. The Americans invented the term populist in the late, in the 1880s and 1890s. Uh, in opposition to the gold standard, but in the 20th century, it was largely in the developing world, in Latin America, that the populists were particularly powerful, um, with their aim largely at the international economy seen as dominated by uh, the advanced industrial countries. The new round of populism in the developing world, as represented by people like Duterte and the man who will almost certainly be the next president of Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, uh, in the emerging markets, there are, is continuing resentment about currency crises, about austerity, about debt crises, sovereign debt crises in many instances, um, about the role that elites have played in all of those things. So we know, 
I think, many of us, that to a large extent, some of this resentment may be misplaced, but that doesn't change its relevance, its political power, or its importance. Right? Um, it's not just central banks, but the entire financial system, as I said, that is in many ways a creature of the political order. And I'll point out one example, which is that Donald Trump and his supporters, actually starting with the Tea Party in 2010, had as one of their heroes Andrew Jackson. Now, for those of you who don't know or remember their American politics, Andrew Jackson's principal claim to fame was his fundamental hostility to banks and central banks. He closed down the central bank of the United States, thereby causing a financial crisis, and he came close to closing down all the banks in the country. This was the hero of the Tea Party and of the supporters of Donald Trump in 2016. I have a poster on my, on my office wall that is a picture of Andrew Jackson saying he was the first Tea Party. This is a poster issued by the Tea Party saying the first Tea Party president was Andrew Jackson. So I, don't, I think that, that this is the principal challenge that faces international financial actors, both public and fri private. That is to address this resentment. Because resentment in politics turns into policies, turns into politicians and parties that win elections, turns into policies that could very well threaten the existence of an integrated financial system. I don't think that persuasion will work. I mean, my, my friends, the economists, typically say if we just explain to people things like comparative advantage, then they would not worry about the fact that they've lost their job. That, that people have legitimate concerns and legitimate complaints. Um, they may have misplaced villains, but their complaints are legitimate and have to, rep uh, have to be taken seriously. The real challenge, I think, is that faced by our governments. How do you address these legitimate concerns? How do you provide support for those who have been hard done by the economic and financial developments of the last 20, 30, 40 years? How do you provide compensation for them? How do you provide them a sense that they're being represented in the political arena? So far, I have to say, being a little bit well, I guess I'd say pessimistic, except uh, pessimist is a well-informed optimist. So uh, I don't see any particular willingness to engage directly to take into, take into serious consideration the need to deal with the concerns of those who are the base of the populist movements, to, to think about what kinds of benefits right, can be given to those who have been suffering and who are, in fact, now rebelling in the political order. What I see, not to be put too fine a point on it if I want to talk about the United States, is a great, uh, uh, what's the word, great uh, 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 appreciation for benefits that the winners from globalization have received, including things like tax cuts and re deregulation, and leaving the politics to the politicians. That's not sustainable. Finance will come under sustained assault. An integrated international economy will come under sustained assault. The best defense is to work hard, in my view, to develop new models of social policies, of political representation that go beyond platitudes and that actually work to try to satisfy the real needs of people whose suffering is not imagined, but real. If that's not done, I think that the axis that has been developing over the last five years, what we might call the Trump, Kaczynski, Bolsonaro, Duterte, Salvini axis, we'll soon find finance to be a very attractive target, and the target will have no weapons. Thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed. I, I think you, you'll have a lot of questions uh, to be more, I would say, elaborating your uh, new models of social policy, because I, I guess that you very rightly are uh, indicating what is the main, main political problem in practically all uh, societies in the world, and certainly in all advanced economies. Thank you so much for uh, this presentation. Can I turn to Daniel now? Uh, uh, I understand you will also elaborate on the emerging world, perhaps, uh, and the developing world, but okay, you have I, the floor. I have a slide, but I'm not going to use the slides. I'm going to go, to go very rapidly. Yeah, please. Uh, I, it, to a large extent, I mean, it's, I, I'm, um, I'm seeing eye to eye with what Jeffrey has said. Now, the, first, the very broad picture, in my view, we, we are increasing fragility of uh, the institutional framework of, of the international arrangements for, for various reasons. The erosion of multilateralism, in my view, is not 
uh, is not going to be uh, uh, short. Um, Time-wise, uh, it's going to continue. Um, it may be it may be that uh, uh, several blocks could relent resilience to the global institutional environment, uh, but. In the, in the short while, I think erosion will continue, because as some some people said this morning, what's very uncomfortable for the Western world is losing supremacy in economic terms, and this is going to continue. And 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 one understands why uh, Trump is not on his own. I mean, it's, it, the syndrome is much larger, much more profound. Is this the global financial system safer? I have doubts about it, and I'll, I'll get back to it. Social cohesion is both in advanced countries, in advanced economies, and, and, and in emerging economies is under strain. And there is fragmentation, and, and this is going to be even more complicated in your area. Uh, political legitimacy is a huge issue, and I think Ashok made uh, a, a, a good remark in, in, in this respect. Uh, new technologies can bring about havoc and climate change is also a huge issue. Increasingly, central bankers pay attention to climate change. Um, the most recent seminar uh, uh, at the ECB on macroprudential policy, the SRB, focused on, on climate change, the, the first panel. Now, I think that the unconventional policies have ushered into a new global financial cycle. And as you said, I mean, the big question is, how is it coming to come to an end? I mean, the, the new fi global financial cycle. Because there is a huge, huge rise, both in public and private debts around the world. So how will governments and central banks, in my view, central banks will have to intervene again? And what we call now unconventional policies will be revisited. And including printing money. Now, uh, I'll put aside emerging markets, but, but when it comes to policy normalization, I would say I, I, I have a very hard time in believing that policy rates, monetary policy rates, will get back to the pre-crisis levels. It's not going to happen, even if the Fed has raised interest for the policy rates quite, I mean, when you say more than significantly, and I don't believe the ECB will go, is going to go, I mean, to such, um, uh, to such an extent with raising the policy rates, and not because only Italy, it's because of the state of the financial, financial system. Now, is the financial system safer nowadays? No, I'm not going to see the slides. I have a Banks are, be are better capitalized and less leveraged, it's true, but it is a very tough call to say that the global financial system is safer. Shadow banking has been on the rise, according to estimates made by the ECB and the SRB, more than 50% of the assets are assigned to the shadow sector, sh shadow bank sector, the so-called non-banks, but which, can, which operate as banks and that's much less severely regulated. Uh, we don't have sufficient transparency as to operations of non-banks. Systemic risk evolved in capital markets, in my view, if I were asked, where, where is the next big shock going to come from? I would say from non-banks, from, from shadow banking. And I'm asking myself, who's going to provide the land of last resort function in, 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 in capital markets? We know central banks are supposed to do it when it comes to banks. But what about non-banks or big banks? We had the failure of a Swedish central counterparty. What if we'll have a failure of a very big central counterparty? Who's going to step in? Um, so what I think is also quite dismaying is that there is a new wave of finance deregula uh, uh, deregulation in the United States. Hopefully, it will stay small for small banks. But if, if it's going to, to be on a large scale, <laughs> That would be a, a, a historical uh, a mistake. Then we have the cyber attacks and so on and so on. 
Now, re-examining a few concepts, low inflation can be very misleading. If external balances grow, then a country has a, a big problem. Financial markets do not distinguish between public debt and private debts. It's the overall external indebtedness of, of, of an economy. Trust and lack of trust is increasing. The lack of trust is increasing all over the world. What can trigger an additional loss of trust? Hidden vulnerabilities that come brutal into the open. We don't know, I mean, clear. What is the state of the European banking sector? We still have doubts about the size of NPLs. The erosion of a central bank credibility. Many central banks are under siege and politicians attack central banks, including the Fed is under attack. So uh, insufficient buffers, a country needs buffers to run very low deficits and, uh, and, and the size of an economy. If an economy is very small, then it's, I would say, it's more fragile than a larger economy. And finally, I would say, protectionism and erosion of multilateral arrangements can have a huge impact. I, th I believe that there is an inward looking syndrome spreading around what you have alluded to. And politicians will have to respond. You cannot continue to tell people, yeah, you're not smart enough, you don't get it. The benefits are, how can you tell to a large number of losers that they are not smart enough? That they don't get it. I mean, this is sheer political stupidity. You, 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 you cannot explain it to people at large. You have to do something. Public policy, I think we're blindfolded. We're wrong for a very, very long time. Now, uh, a new global order, we have to see. In my view, there's going to be a several block-based, I, I, I wouldn't say multilateral. We have to redefine multilateralism in terms of block-based uh, arrangements. Brexit, Brexit, I think we are underestimate the impact of Brexit. Brexit can, if it's a hard Brexit, it's, get, it's going to be very bad for Europe. Um, over that will stay with us and we should worry about over that. It's, that's are larger than they were in the pre-crisis years. Uh, income inequality create tensions in society and they fuel populism and protectionism. And we have redefined globalization. The way we understand globalization and we have to, uh, to have new policies. And finally, new technologies may destroy more than create jobs, at least in the short run. We should not bet very much on, on, on new technologies. And we see that there are limits to our models. Policies continue to navigate in uncharted waters. And we have to, be, to I mean, to, I shouldn't say we have to pray, but I think we have to be much more pragmatic and still be prepared for unconventional policies. I would not refrain from asking central banks if I were a policymaker or a central banker to say it's the end of unconventional policies. Forget about it. It may continue. Central banks may continue to be the only game in town, central banks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I must say that <laughs> let's pray is a very good <laughs> conclusion, obviously, for uh, you know all, all the... Uh, very negative views that we have until now. I don't see too much optimism. So uh, again, <laughs> my, my dear Olivier, at the time you'll have to stick <coughs> uh, I uh, give the floor now to um, Motoshige uh, Ito. You have the floor. And I hope that you will tell us that the lessons we can draw from the Japanese crisis are such that we will get out of the mess. Okay. Please. Thank you. Uh, because I have only eight, eight minutes, I try to be very brief. Uh, I just uh, speak chronological order. So 1997, we had a very serious financial crisis. And the lesson we learned is just uh, too small and too late. And political factor was most important. At that time, it was almost impossible to just persuade the politicians to just have a very big capital injection or bailout process. I hope our failure uh, of this time may give some kind of uh, a good uh, advice to other countries after 2008 uh, crisis. Now, second is uh, around 2000, in the period of the IT bubble uh, crash, and Japan was just in the edge of entering into the deflation. And uh, uh, for some reason, Bank of Japan uh, introduced very problematic or, or controversial 
raise of the uh, policy rate. <coughs> Maybe Bank of Japan was very unlucky because we had a IT bubble crash and 9-11 next year. But anyway, what happened is it took almost uh, 12 or 30 years for us to get out of the deflationary uh, trap. So once we are getting into the deflationary trap, it's very difficult to get out of the uh, trap with traditional uh, policy. Just you remember, Bank of Japan was already zero interest rate policy for this period. So monetary policy is very important when we are in a critical uh, position of the deflation. Now, number three is abenomics, especially uh, Mr. Crowder came. And as you know, the so-called unorthodox uh, monetary policy, maybe combination of two, one is very dramatic expansion of the base money. And the other is very uh, explicit inflation targeting of 2%. And that was very successful to change the mindset of the people just overnight. You can just confirm how market changes by looking at GDP or employment <coughs> numbers or corporate productivity or the exchange rate and so on and so forth. So uh, the, that kind of unorthodox uh, or non-traditional monetary policy sometimes may be difficult when necessary, when the economy is in serious deflation trap. Now, number four, however, <laughs> also we can, uh, the, that kind of policy can be very effective to get out of the deflationary, deflationary trap, but we cannot achieve the target inflation level. So the original targeting level is 2%, but we are, we are still around or below 1%. So something is missing here. Uh, I, I don't, there are many discussions here, but uh, one of the most important things is we have to think both supply side and demand side. The monetary expansion is a very typical demand side policy. And uh, if we have a very uh, good expanding demand, we hope supply side is, is just catching up. But that didn't happen for many reasons you probably know very well. And one of the reasons why this is very important is which is not increasing in Japan. And without increasing wage, you can't expect just inflation rate, it's just getting higher. And you can find many so-called the unfunctioning labor market in the case of Japan, which is reflected in the wage. And this is also very important for us to think about the future of the, the, the international economy. I mentioned yesterday that unfortunately, uh, the potential growth rate of major country, including the United States, is not very high. Uh, Robert Gordon just uh, mentioned just total factor productivity have been very low. But at the same time, uh, many countries, including Japan, United States, Europe, is just doing very, very stimulating demand. So as long as demand is just spring up, the economy is good. But once that demand is just losing, then there's very uh, big size of the backlash because we depend so much on demand. And so when demand is uh, going down, maybe because of the U.S., China trade conflict, maybe because of the crash of the financial market, whatever. So we have to be very careful of the very big magnitude of possible change because of the difficult demand. Now, the lesson five is what is most important now in Japan. And that is the, the uh, unfortunately quantitative uh, theory of money is not working in short period. It may be true that if we just expand money supply, price is eventually going up, but it's never land according to Keynes. So we, we have already uh, passed six years, six years, and still not going on. Then as time go and go, then the cost from untraditional uh, monetary policy become bigger and bigger. And we are now that kind of discussion. Well, you can think of many uh, distortion. One is just market for government bond and the stock market. The Bank of Japan just buy so much of this asset, and you can just identify many difficult problems coming from man, and possibly also the big possible uh, the ba but deficit of Bank of Japan may cause some uh, problem. And second, uh, distortion of the very prolonged the monetary expansion is long-term interest rate. For some reason, Bank of Japan introduced what we call yield curve control, by which they mean the 10-year government bond rate should be around 0%. It may be good for uh, the stimulating purpose. However, you can easily imagine 
that is very big hurt uh, hurting to the uh, banking sector. It's not only the profitability of the banking sector. Banking sector's problem is a problem of the channel for the credit. And also, it also has very important implication for fiscal consolidation. You know, our debt GDP ratio is above, about 200% in some category. However, if you look at just the debt service of the Japanese government, it's surprising low because interest rate on the, uh, the marginal uh, issue of the government bond is zero. So they can borrow money for nothing. And that is a very, very good story in a short period, but that has uh, provided a less and less incentive for politi politicians to thinking about seriously about the fiscal consolidation. So political aspect is very important. So this is a lesson we learn from our experience. Thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed. When you were speaking of the difficulty to get increases in wages and salaries uh, so that you will have the supply <laughs> element for, uh, for uh, inflation at uh, the target, I cannot help uh, reflecting on, on the case of Europe, uh, which uh, is very, very similar not because the whole Europe is in that situation, but, but be because Germany in particular, which is necessarily the seeding for, uh, for the augmentation of, uh, of the wages and salaries, uh, is very, very low, obviously. So we, we, the, the ECB has the same problem and the same difficulty. And uh, we, we must understand much better why exactly it is so difficult in uh, your country and others to have the, what we would expect in such a situation with full employment uh, and so forth. So thank you very, very much. I think that we have now to turn to Bertrand. Uh, and uh, what we are expecting, Bertrand, is that you would concentrate on environment, uh, mm. at least uh, yes, invest, yes, yes, financing. Yes and no. I'm afraid I will not contribute to the euphoria. Yeah. And yeah. I will defer to my Washington neighbor to <laughs> cheer us up after that. Uh, so I, I will come from a different perspective from the same conclusion as, as Jeff. Uh, so we are 10 years, uh, as has been said, after Lehman. We are also 10 years after the Bitcoin, incidentally. Uh, so where do we stand? Uh, and I would be very, maybe at the risk of being simplistic or too provocative, I say we have not really started to answer the underlying questions raised by the crisis. We have patched up the system. I think we have prevented the collapse of the system, and that's a good news. As far as I know, we are not on the verge of the Third World War, and we should be very happy of that. Uh, but I think we have not yet started to, to discuss what comes next and what is the type of financial system that we need to build. And maybe it's too late. That would be my conclusion if you want to start sleeping now. So we have two questions that, that, uh, that needs to be addressed. First one is, what is finally the type of economy that we want to finance? And environment, of course, is part of it. And then if we answer that question, how do we want to finance that economy? Uh, and my, my main concern is, is that in the past 10 years, we have not really touched the art of the system. So we have tried to provide an answer on the type of economy that was a, the big momentum of 2015. Uh, interesting date, a year before the Brexit and a year before Trump, when we adopted the Sustainable Development Goals, when we all signed uh, the Paris Agreement on Climate. So that was a roadmap. This is the type of economy we want. We want a sustainable economy that benefits everybody on Earth. And that's great on paper, and it's been ratified but for one on climate uh, universally. So we have the roadmap, and again, that's, that's a pretty good news. The bad news is that three years down the road, we are not there at all, and neither on the Sustainable Development Goals nor on climate, as has been amply demonstrated by the various reports published in the past few weeks, including the one from the IPCC and the UN. Um, so that's for the macro perspective on the question, what, what type of economy do we want to finance? On the micro aspect, I think we have focused on a piecemeal regulatory approach. So we have treated the bank and then the insurance and the non-bank and insurance, etc. But we've never discussed a holistic approach to the system. How do we want the system to finance the infrastructure gap, for instance, etc. We have not really de dealt with the ethical problem. We have dealt with compliance, which is a very poor substitute to ethics. And I think that's, uh, that's something which will backfire. It's not because you tick a box that you prevent the next problem to happen. Uh, we have done, in fact, very little innovation. So we should, I mean, there is a lot of market share in, in the media on the green bonds or social bonds, etc. but it's still a tiny drop in the fixed income bucket. So again, we have not really uh, made any real progress on that front. 
And, and basically, here we are 10 years down the road, so good news, not pre-World War situation, hopefully. Bad news, uh, we, are not, we don't know where we're heading to. I think it's a, it's a traditional combination of more of the same and too little too late. To a certain extent, our, our conversation actually is reflect that. We start now to be obsessed with the tree of the next financial crisis, and we have forgotten the forest of the climate crisis, and we have forgotten the jungle of the people's anger and resentment. So we are back to the technical con consideration of the next financial crisis, but the big picture that emerged 10 years ago is still, is still there. Uh, it's very difficult to address now, because we are in the state of civil war at the global level. I mean, you have two models which have emerged uh, and which are on a colliding course, maybe not, I hope not. Uh, two new feudalism, in a way, the US one and the Chinese one. This kind of G2 order is not really an order, I would say it's probably more a trap, where people might be forced to choose between one model or the other, a transactional Trump-led America, or if I may be very aggressive, a predatory China with a Belt and Road Initiative. So how can we go beyond that? How can we really address the heart of the system, the root cause which has made finance, the, the, I mean, the legitimate scapegoat of this crisis? Uh, we have done a little bit on the reporting front. I mean, all these boring things, reporting, accounting, monitoring, etc. we've never discussed that. How do you want to focus on the long term when the basis of the accounting rules are based on liquidative value? You are, you are mark to market. So how do you want to think 20 years down the road when, I mean, I've been a CFO for many years. I know you prepare a quarterly report. So you prepare things because a quarterly report is what matters for you, not what happens in 20 years, despite everything said by the great leaders. So we have to think about this. And the problem is that in today's world, I don't see where people will start this conversation on the fact, on, on the way the system is run. So in conclusion, I think the question of trust has been said by my neighbor and many is central. And the problem is that trust is not there. The problem it is uh, it does lead to a, a misallocation of capital at the global level. We have uh, too much money going where it's not really needed. I mean, why do people keep buying negative rates German or Swiss bonds today instead of investing where it's most needed, in Latin America, in Africa, in South Asia? That's, that's a real problem. I mean, you can build walls to address this misallocation of capital. It will not last forever. So we have a problem to address through regulatory framework. Again, it's not just solvency, it's not just Basel Suite, it's a combination of all this. And that every day I'm discovering issues in that framework which are just atrocious. I mean, not the big ones, but even the small ones are terrible. You have these perception issues which we know. We have too much compliance. You have too much risk aversion, and you can be risk adverse for five or 10 years, not forever. So we have to find a way to, to, to move there. And if I, if I may really conclude with that, it reminded me of the, uh, sorry for the non-French uh, people in the room, but in high school I read a, a theater play from a French play, uh, a writer called Jean Giraudoux, who wrote La Guerre de Troyes n'aura pas lieu. The War of Troy will not happen in 1936 or 37, if my memory is correct. If you remember, we are. This is, a, this is a, the setup, the stage. You have Ulysse, Odysseus in, in English, uh, and Hector, we discuss and say, it's crazy, we're not gonna go to war. And these are the technocrats, the reasonable people, because of Hélène. I mean, we'll not have our kids killed for Hélène. But at the end, as we know, the war of Troy happened. And, and uh, uh, Odysseus has this very tough word, this is a privilege, the privilege des grands. So the privilege of the rich and, and, and powerful is to think they can watch a catastrophe from their balcony. I think we are again at the balcony. We are afraid of the next crisis, but the real one behind it is not, is not being addressed. So my conclusion is that uh, we have not really started the hard work and the, the window of opportunity to start this work is shrinking now. And we might have missed the boat and uh, I hope we are, not, we are on a solid balcony. I'm not sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was uh, <laughs> expecting some kind of, uh, you know, happy uh, ending, but it's <laughs> not exactly the case. And I, to be frank, to all speakers, I would say that you might remember that the, the motto of IBM was if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And uh, we, we need solutions now, <laughs> and we should concentrate on the solutions. Uh, I don't uh, see our friend. He's uh, out, so <laughs> he, will, he will be back. He will be back. So uh, thank you very, very much for this exposition. <laughs> it was uh, really uh, smashing uh, with a lot of issues uh, addressed. So can I ask uh, who wants to take the floor immediately? Yeah, please, with uh, solutions. You have the floor. Uh, 
I, I don't have many solutions. I just want to refer to Barbara Tuckman's March of Folly, which starts as a first chapter with <coughs> the stupidity of government, uh, the king of Troy uh, letting in the horse, and he shouldn't have done that. The, um, uh, I was a bit involved in, uh, in, the, in the Euro crisis, and a lot of what we did had to do with governance, mm -hmm. governance inside the European Union, that is. We, uh, for instance, we transferred a lot of powers from the capitals <coughs> to Brussels as far as fiscal discipline is concerned, and we transferred a lot of national powers to the central bank as far as <coughs> um, um, uh, sup um, prudential supervision was concerned. Now, I thought about that when uh, Professor Frieden was referring to <coughs> new socio-political socio models. And I was wondering whether we are thinking enough about something which may seem too far-fetched given the fact that multilateralism is going down, uh, <coughs> down a slippery slope anyway, but that we shouldn't think uh, a bit more about what instruments we can build, we could build, we could build over time to try and make sure that the, the, the policies one country is following is not harming and hurting too much the uh, other countries. That's the basic line we have inside the European Union. The economic policy of an individual country is considered to be a matter of common interest. You cannot do, even if you, and if you did, it turns against you like it was a case in Ireland. So I would like to, to know, <coughs> Professor Frieden, whether there is any thinking on the governance side of uh, all the uh, crises and catastrophes which uh, are looming over us. Thank you. Thank you. I ask the, the speakers to take note of uh, questions which uh, they are addressed. Thank you very much indeed. Other issues? Please. Uh, Jean-Claude, you started by saying that uh, you were concerned about um, the world economy now and the prospect of a new crisis, but you didn't explain uh, why. Uh, I wonder if you could do that. Uh, but let me ask a very uninformed American question, um, which has to do with your assessment that a key to resolving some of the current European problems, Euro problems, lies in Germany and inflation. Um, could you explain that and uh, tell us why they won't do it? Uh, <laughs> Part of your questions uh, is only echoing my own interrogation on Japan and, uh, and uh, Germany and perhaps the Netherlands, uh, countries uh, where the unions in particular, the labor force, is uh, so keen, rightly so, to reach uh, full employment and not take any risk on full employment that finally you don't have what you would have expected at a certain level of... Uh, heating or overheating, namely the real demand coming from the, the labor force. Uh, in a way, this is a phenomenon that we are observing in all countries, but it's particularly acute, it seems to me, in certain culture, and in certain culture which are at the level of full employment and where everybody uh, in the social uh, fabric likes very much to stay and doesn't want to take any risk. Uh, I must confess myself, I made a mistake on, on the German uh, fabric because I thought that at a certain level of full employment, then you would have this kind of uh, request for uh, augmentation of wages and salaries that would augment unit labor costs, that would have, that would permit Germany to be back to, I would say, a more normal level of inflation, taking into account the current account surplus of 8% of GDP and, and, and and would permit them to be back to their traditional yearly inflation or the, during the 40 years before the euro, which was significantly higher than what we are observing since we have the euro. So my, my own response provisional would be, we are in a situation first where, again, unions in general and the labor force considers that the wage restraints were extremely effective and efficient in getting full employment. And, and that before changing their own behavior, uh, they would uh, reflect a lot. And they are still reflecting in, in some respect. 
a second explanation, which is also new, and uh, I uh, am reflecting on that since, uh, say, two years, is that we were perhaps under-assessing labor mobility inside the Euro area. We observed much more uh, Spanish, Portuguese, uh, Italian going in Germany than we would have expected. And you know that the main criticism of the Euro area at the very beginning was you, you will not have this labor mobility which exists in the US and you will be hampered by that. The, the paradox is that we had not much labor mobility at the start and that in the crisis, because of the crisis, we are perhaps observing a high level of labor mobility. I, I'm, I was struck by the fact that it looks like 300,000 workers coming from the Euro area came in Germany in, 50, in year 15. That, that was not expected, frankly speaking. And of course, it's such a big influx of uh, new labor that you can understand that it weakens considerably the demand of the German citizens that are themselves uh, working uh, in, in the labor force. So th that's for, for, for your second question. Your, your first question was not, what was different? I was huh? to, uh, ask you to explain. Yeah, why, why I am worrying. <laughs> well, uh, we, <laughs> as you could see, it is a sentiment which is quite generalized, obviously. If I would concentrate on only three elements, say three, in order not to embark on eight and nine or whatever, because you, you can go very far. Uh, first, I am struck by the fact that we still have augmentation of financial leverage at the global level. There are different me methodology, different computation. I myself uh, chaired uh, the G30. I'm still honorary chairman of the G30. We produce a report which was clearly signaling, but it was two or three years ago, that the pace of additional outstanding debt, public and private, at a global level, as a percentage of global GDP, had continued after the crisis, more or less at the same pace as before the crisis. Might not be exactly the same now. Uh, the IMF has worked a lot on that and produce figures that are different from the figures we had. The idea, nevertheless, that it, it continued to, to go on uh, in, at the global level is still there. Another element which uh, is, of course, uh, a little bit intriguing is that the epicenter of the crisis was in the advanced economy, and the advanced economy have deleveraged a little bit in uh, some of them at least, substantially, other less substantially, in the private sector. But apart from a very few cases, they continue to augment leverage in the public sector, in the public finance sector. And so all taken into account, I would say that the pace of additional uh, debt outstanding, public and private, as a percentage of GDP, which was 90% before the crisis of the augmentation of debt outstanding is now only 50%. So you could say, if, if the pace is the same, it is a big diminishing uh, by a factor two of uh, their contribution to global leverage, financial leverage. If you take the emerging economies and all the other economies, then they had a contribution of 10% and it's now 50%. So it has been multiplied by five. And of course, China is a case in point because we, we see a very big augmentation of uh, debt outstanding, uh, particularly, I have to say, uh, in the private sector or so-called private sector with an explosion, uh, in particularly, of corporate bonds. But all, all that taken into account, of course, signals something which is very unhealthy, namely that we did not draw the lessons from the fact that the crisis was one of the major dimensions of the crisis was over leveraging. And uh, I would uh, fully echo what has been said on Fisher and, uh, and also on Minsky. <laughs> we, we have there elements that are worrying. Second, second uh, uh, element, of course, asset inflation that we have observed in a number of countries, and of course, particularly in the United States of America. So a correction will happen. Uh, Jean-Claude is uh, particularly, uh, I would say, worrying on that. 
uh, I think that uh, many, uh, many very good uh, American economists are also particularly uh, uh, worrying, I have to say, and uh, Martin Feldstein in particular uh, regularly says, oh, 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 something will happen. Of course, it never happens at a time that you can predict. So when you continue to make money out of the increase of uh, the assets uh, that you have on the, on the uh, share and stocks markets, uh, you, you appear as a stupid guy <laughs> if you disinvest or if you uh, give good advice to your clients. Uh, but at the time, uh, these, these advices will be good. <laughs> but that, that's uh, what we all always observe. A uh, last point, which is not to be neglected, is that uh, in the cycle, we are in a number of countries, 10 years after the start of the recovery, we had counter-cyclical uh, measures that were taken in a number of countries, particularly in the United States of America. So this is not good in terms of, uh, I would say, uh, uh, smoothing uh, the, the cycle. Uh, it, it amplifies the possible cycle, particularly when time comes for a recession. And of course, when the recession comes, as has been said, you have very meager ammunitions as regards both the monetary policy, I have to say particularly in Japan and in Europe, but also in the US in many respects, where normally they, they, they say, I'm speaking under the control of eminent economists, that they would need 5% decrease of interest rates to have something which would be significant to combat the recession, and, and they are not there. And it's very unlikely that they would be there uh, when time comes. And of course, the fiscal, the, the, you know, the fiscal element in countering the crisis is not there either. And uh, only a very few countries in the world can say we have room for maneuvering. So you see all these elements, but I'm only stick to those three, are not putting me in a situation to be very optimistic, obviously. So thank you very much for your question. Uh, of course, uh, the uh, speakers can intervene any time huh, if they think uh, appropriate. Uh, I have Renaud and then you. Okay. Uh, should I understand from this session that um, there was too much quantitative easing from the Fed and um, from the cent uh, European Central Bank, which is a kind of, kind of quantitative easing, that's my first question. And my second question is, can we consider that for the, this crisis that you are all more or less predicting us, uh, quantitative easing would not be an efficient tool? Maybe we could take note of this question and then the speakers will respond and take the last uh, question in that batch of uh, first uh, questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of the uh, workshop, so I may have missed some of the things. Uh, coming from my perspective, I'm a banker. I've been a banker for many years. I'm still in financial services. I work for European banks and American banks. And my sense, I've lived through many financial crises, including in the last financial crisis. And one of the things that struck me is that, of course, there was a lot of leverage in financial institutions at the beginning of the, so the, the case of Lehman is obvious. There was a, a leverage of 50 or 40 to 50, so which is, now things have improved a lot, particularly for American banks. I would say it's fair to say that American banks are probably better capitalized than European banks on average. But having said that, don't you think that we are in a situation where regulation has been implemented, Dodd-Frank nevertheless has some shortcomings and weaknesses. There's been attempt to reform, and my sense would be, because you're looking for solution, don't you think that if we want to reduce the burden of some of the regulation, we have to increase the capitalization of banks? And recently, I had the opportunity of listening to Alan Greenspan, who was speaking to the Economic Club in New York, and Alan Greenspan was making the case that we probably need to be in a safe situation, and we're talking of regulated institutions, but also, obviously, the comment that has been made about shadow banking is very pertinent and, and absolutely adequate. Don't you think that the leverage, which is now probably, I mean, the capitalization of banks is about 10%. Now, we said 10, 11, 12%, depending for the ciphers, it can be up to 12%. Don't you think that we can request 15 and perhaps 20% to be in a safer environment, to be able to take care of all of the problems that will come up at some point. 
It's a good question. Uh, in Europe, I think we are uh, approximately at 14%, if I take the significant financial institution. In the US, it's higher, it seems to me. Anyway, thank you very much. Then we have several questions, and perhaps we can make a tour de table. So, uh, in the order of, uh, of intervention, perhaps, uh, can I uh, ask each speaker whether he has any comment to make or any response to, to bring uh, to, to, uh, to the questions we had? You have the floor. Eden. I, I answered the question regarding the, the, the quantitative easing. Um, I still think uh, maybe um, uh, QE create a lot of uh, problem, p particularly as, some, as someone uh, claim the QE take, uh, take care of Wall Street first, then take care of Main Street later. That mean uh, uh, using quote other people say is a, is a classical logic, but at least. Um, QE makes sense to uh, save the uh, whole financial crisis uh, from totally collapsing. Uh, in that sense, I guess, for example, in, in China, um, we don't see, uh, don't um, uh, define the stimulus uh, package uh, in 2009 as a QE, but actually it is a the total money China put uh, occupied 12% of GDP of China, much more than uh, US. I guess US money total per, per is 9% of uh, US GDP. But in some way, uh, it, it, it is working. Although they create lots of uh, uh, negative problem, but I don't think there is a another better way to deal with these kind of uh, systematic uh, uh, collapse. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much indeed. So can I, can I turn to uh, Jean-Claude now? How would you respond? Maybe I can comment on uh, Renaud's question about quantitative easing. Yeah. You would better do so than, than me. But uh, I think it has, been, it has been a very good thing. It has been a miracle that has been invented with this quantitative easing, both in the United States and in Europe. The problem is when we stop, when you stop it, it's a kind of drug, you know, you have a drug and then you stop your opium and then you are, you feel very bad. That's a question we raise, uh, we, which we can raise today. When we stop it, especially when the things are not very good, because again, we must not uh, then smoke opium today, things are not good today. There's a lack of trust, there's an anxiety. Uh, as a matter of fact, I wrote my paper uh, beginning, end of September, beginning of October, wrote it, drafted. Well, 10 days after, markets, 10% less. So tomorrow, I don't uh, not tomorrow because the markets are closed, but Monday, I don't know. Uh, we are in a, we're, we're, we're in a, we're in a new world now. The end, in a way, in a way, I must say, from a moral viewpoint, it's quite good, because it has been obscene to see the stock market going up every day by one percent, uh, with people with one percent being extremely rich, and the rest of the population, which has who has no stock stocks in his pocket, being poorer and poorer. Q. I turn to Jeff. A lot to comment on. I'll try to focus on some of the more political or political economy issues. Just, I have to say on the quantitative easing, to me, the crucial lesson I take away from, obviously from the economics, if I agree with what's been said, the crucial point that I would take away is that this was um, a result of the unwillingness or inability of governments to engage in a sufficient fiscal stimulus. And the fact that the relatively independent central banks took all, carried all the water, pretty much, for the recovery indicates the very weak political bases that we have 
for confronting the problems that arise. We should have had a much bigger stimulus in the U.S., and European policy was pro-cyclical rather than counter-cyclical. So, so I think that tells us something about the, be that's the beginnings of the understanding of the political failures that we've seen. I wanted to start, not start, I wanted to address particularly the point about global governance, which after all is the, the, the uh, dilemma or the slogan of the, of the meeting. Um, there is a very clear normative view, very straightforward. Just as when l financial markets went from local to national, there are public goods associated with financial markets, whether it's Levner of Last Resort facilities, financial stability in itself is a public good, and so we got national financial institutions that provided the public good of financial stability. We have global financial markets today. There's clearly a demand for some something resembling global public goods provision in the international financial system. Some could argue that to some extent it's been provided by cooperation at the level of the G7 or the G20. Uh, some could argue that it's been provided some aspect of lender last resort facilities provided by the IMF, augmented by national governments. So there's a clear normative argument for something that we would call global governance in the financial system as in elsewhere. But the financial system is particularly striking both because the theoretical underpinnings of understanding why there's a need for public goods provision in finance are very strong. Um, and also I would say that to some extent it's gone farther in finance than anywhere else. If you had asked me 25 years ago, would there be this level of cooperation at the regulatory level with Basel or in, in with, the, with the fund, with bailouts, with, uh, with uh, programs and monetary policy cooperation, all this, I would have probably said no, no way. So there's been more progress made. The problem is that for the continued provision of those global public goods or even something resembling global public goods, there has to be domestic political support. People are not going to support government policies that are aimed at some abstract, ethereal notion of global financial stability, first, if they don't see that it's going to help them, and second, if they believe that it's going to hurt them, which they do. As an example, some of you may remember that there was massive opposition in the U.S. to the bank bailout, not the bank bailouts, but the sovereign debt bailouts of the 1990s, such that there were a whole series of laws passed which seriously hamstring the ability of the Fed and the Treasury to engage in, in these packages. The sponsor of both significant legislations was Bernie Sanders. Right. And he has continued to make the argument that American involvement in these packages is against the interests of, of, of the American people. And Donald Trump doesn't have that sophistication, but if he did, and his people do, they will make the same argument. And this is directly relevant, actually, to Jim's point, or to the question there that, that Jim asked about Germany. It, and and the, the point is not that, that countries malignantly decide to impose costs on other countries. Right? It's that they're concerned legitimately with their own political, economic, and social well-being. The Germans did not continue to run massive surpluses at a time when they should have been spending them down and running deficits. I mean, the, the old line is that the problem of Europe in the crisis was German economic thinking, which said that every country in Europe should run surpluses with Germany, and Germany should run surpluses with every country in Europe. Uh, obviously unsustainable, but, but it didn't come from some bloody-mindedness on the part of the German people. It came, as Jean-Claude was saying, I, I'd say some people, there are arguments in the literature about why. Some people think that essentially it's an unholy alliance of exporters and the elderly in Germany uh, insisting on low wages and low inflation, but you could talk about national cultures as well. The point is that German economic policy is driven by the demands of the German people. And if you can't get in an integrated, in, in, as play, in, a, in a region as integrated as Europe, where Germans support European integration, if you can't get a commitment to do something that is essential for the prosperity of other members of the Eurozone out of the German people, then the underlying problem of what is the domestic political support for that kind of global cooperation or global, public, global government is going to look like. It, it did not look good in the crisis. It does not look good now. We face more difficulties, and we now have political movements that are, in some cases, very, very explicitly opposed to anything that looks like global cooperation. 
I want to mention one more thing because people have been talking about leverage. I think leverage is always an important issue. To me, it's, it's not leverage per se, but where it is, who it will harm, and how it will be addressed. And people talk about the emerging markets. I think the, that there's a crucial fact about leverage in the emerging markets that has gotten far too little attention. The big story of the last 15 years in the emerging markets is that for the first time in modern history, sovereigns can borrow in their own currency. Right? So there's the old original sin argument. That original sin has somehow been atoned for. So Peru sells all of its government debt to foreign funds. So sovereigns are borrowing in local currency. But the private sector is borrowing ex almost exclusively in foreign currency. And so when a government faces, let's imagine a government, let's call it Argentina, that faces a crisis, that Argentina actually is a case where no one was doing any borrowing, so it doesn't come up. Let's say a crisis like the Argentine crisis happens to Peru, and the government finds that its only way out is to substantially devalue the soul. It's not going to hurt government finances, because government, li government liabil liabilities are our own solace. It's going to bankrupt the private sector. And that's going to be the political challenge that the emerging markets are going to face, and by extension that the financial system is going to face when these countries start, start facing difficulties. It's going to be a rerun of the 80s on steroids. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Chef. I see that, no, 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 uh, I'm continuing the speaker's tour de table. Uh, they have to, <laughs> to respond. So uh, it's uh, Daniel turns. I think that one could try to answer at the surface. I, I shouldn't say superficially, but uh, taking it as a working hypothesis that the basically, basically the system should stay as it is, but we have, to, I, I shouldn't say we tinker on the fringes, but if we <coughs> raise capital ratio, I mean, uh, more capital. Admati and Helbig have been saying for years that banks need to have much more of a cushion of own capital that banks do not have. And why? Because the system in itself, the way it's been constructed over the years, starting with uh, uh, the 70s, with a major decision of, of the American administration, uh, the Nixon administration, has been increasingly destabilizing. I mean, financial markets are, have been increasingly destabilizing economies. And, and, and one could argue that the, the, the global system is overfinanced, overfinanced. And, and finance has been extracting rents. Something has to be done about it. But so this is why there are people, and, but we, we're not discussing it almost at all. Like Mervyn King and others, Turner, Turner at air, who are saying there is something terribly wrong with the basics of the system. We have to change the system, but that, this is very tough. It's like, it's like repairing the, airpl the what airplane. What is the solution? While the airplane, <laughs> no, no, I'm telling you the solution. I, I'll tell you what I think should be done. Um, when it comes to, um, to the euro area, because you mentioned, I think we have to complete the banking union. The banking union, if it is to be completed, has to deal with the fiscal arrangements. There is no other way. A collective deposit insurance scheme boils down to fiscal arrangements. You could call it fiscal integration. You could say not fiscal integration, but it is a fiscal arrangement, which means basically mutualizing risks. Germany, I, I don't see Germany accepting it. If, if it's not done, we'll have an extremely fragile banking union. And, and I think it is a must. It has to be done. Otherwise, more optimistic than, than yourself, but we will see. No, I, I think it has to be done. I mean, you ask me what I think should be done, and I think it should be done. Secondly, and this is what Olivier said this morning, uh, I mean, this afternoon, he said, and in Germany is also, I mean, it's, uh, it's also to be pointed out at, is, is the policy stance. Germany is fond of saying, Rules have to be observed. I mean, we have to, to play by the rules. Okay. But Germany has never accepted that such a big 
current account surplus has to be addressed. And that's also a rule. I mean, as the commission have been saying for years. I mean, the limit is, is 6%. I mean, so, so this also has to be addressed. I believe that banks, in spite of being better capitalized, I think banks should have more capital. They should be. They should be more robust. Relatedly, I have, we have to deal with the non-banks. Non-banks have to be tightly regulated. Many of them, they call themselves non-banks, I mean, but they operate like banks. They have to be regulated, the non-banks. I mean, we cannot allow such a, a big uh, a loophole. Policy coordination, Jeff said, no way, and I, I agree. G20 was capable of doing something. Now, it's much tougher nowadays because of the erosion of multilateralism, and we see it's not happening in the euro area as it, it should. But we, we, we just, we can't accept it. We have to work hard and, and, and do something in terms of policy coordination. Otherwise, we are doomed. And, and, and in addition, the example of Japan. We cannot clone Japan. We cannot say, uh, I mean, the rest of the world is not like Japan. It may, part of the rest of the world may turn into other Japans when it comes to uh, how many residents uh, hold, uh, uh, public debt and, um, and saving and so on and so on. So, so that the system should be much more resilient because there is resilience in the Japanese system. But other, other parts of the, world are, are, of the world are not Japan. Okay, it's a good transition. <laughs> you have the floor. Well, I have uh, three comments, one on financial crisis, second is on QE, and third is a point which I didn't make, which is related to targeted inflation. Now, because I'm from Japan, I know very well about uh, earthquake. It is very difficult to predict earthquake. It is impossible to stop earthquake. So what we are thinking about is how we can just respond after earthquake happen. Mm -hmm. Now, if you use that metaphor, can you predict when this financial crisis is coming? Or can you stop financial crisis? Hopefully, but not. So even prudence policy, uh, mostly is how we can just re react in good way after just the financial crisis coming. So, uh, yes, it is better if we don't have financial crisis. Maybe the second best is smaller financial crisis. And then it should come more. I mean, small earthquake is coming more, then we can just uh, have less large amount of earthquake. Now, I have a very good observation of the Korean financial crisis in 1997. It was, it's very bad when I saw the economy. But if you look at the data, say, five years later or 10 years later, Korean economy just you know, recovered very nicely. So you cannot identify very big <laughs> uh, bad effects of the financial crisis just by looking at the data for 10 years. So I think the resilience or just how we can recover from fiscal uh, financial crisis, it, it, it may be probably more important. Now, second QE, I think uh, I just uh, echo to just the chairman's point, just uh, because interest rate is so low, zero for us, if we have uh, some kind of a very big shock, it is almost impossible to just respond by interest rate policy. So the only remaining policy is quantitative policy and fiscal policy. So in that respect, maybe quantitative policy uh, will be become more important when there's some kind of financial crisis. Now, important thing is quantitative expansion is not only just expansion of balance sheet, and there's a, the other aspect that is what you are going to buy. You can buy government bond, or you can buy some kind of just the, the asset of, from stock market, or you can buy from foreign exchange market. Now, if uh, Japan buys something from foreign exchange market, maybe Mr. Trump will be very angry, so I don't know whether it's politically easy or not. But uh, the stock price, for example, uh, stock market may be very interesting uh, way to inject the money. And also, uh, when the uh, financial crisis happen, uh, or the economy is not very good, uh, fiscal policy uh, in some type is very important. I like uh, this when bank has some kind of problem, capital injection. Uh, may be very important, and uh, that that may help the the just uh, negative impact will be softened. 
The last point, which I didn't mention, but related to the point just uh, uh, was mentioned, just uh, the debt GDP ratio. Now, Japan debt GDP ratio is probably around 200 percent. Or it depends on how you just measure the debt. And of course, we need to just have a, some kind of balancing of deficit. Deficit should be maybe be below 3% or 2%. But even though we have a, just a, the zero deficit uh, from some time, but still that 200% cannot be decreased without increasing nominal GDP. Mm. Now, well, it may be very good if we can have achieve a very high growth rate. But unfortunately, real growth rate or potential growth rate is not very high because TFP is not good. So the only solution. Oh, demographic factors as well. Oh, yeah. So the only solution is just inflation. So not very high inflation, 2% or 3% inflation help a lot because most of the that's accumulated debt for Japan did not come from aging. It just came uh, from just deflation and de shrinking tax revenue because of the economic uh, slump. So, so I think uh, the, the where inflation targeting should be set is very important not only just because for the short-term problem, but more the long-term problem. And it was very much related to the fiscal consolidation problem. Also, I'm sure, I know, it's not very easy to achieve high inflation rate. Thank you. Lo looks difficult, obviously. <laughs> okay, thank you, Motoshige. Uh, I turn to Bertrand. The privilege of being last, I, I will try to be short. Uh, four, four little comments. First, I will echo what you just said, Jeff. Uh, you have two issues with debt, is, is the level and what is it used for? And as I said, we could have used this period of low interest rates to prepare the future and we have not. Right? Not enough, at least. And that's, that's part of the issue. So the, the quantitative element is obviously absolutely crucial. But if at least it would have been used to do something great, that would have been a different story. Uh, so second point. Uh, to, echo, to, to answer the, the question of Jean-Claude on, on, on banks, it's precisely the points I've made. Again, we, we are back to focusing on different pieces of the puzzle instead of focusing on the holistic perspective of the puzzle. I, I think the ratio of banks are okay today. I mean, you can discuss whether here and there. I think we have to finish the, the banking union. Then we started, we still have differences in the financing of economies. I mean, this was one of the issues before the crisis when people argue that in the US the markets are leading and in Europe it's banks and China is different, China, Japan is different. It's, it has not really changed. So we had the, the marvelous slogan of the capital market union in Europe, which I, as far as I know is still a magnific magnificent slogan, but there is no reality behind it. So we have not really addressed that, that, that issue. So I think we really need to, to, to move back to a holistic approach. What do we need to finance this economy? I mean, how do we value equity invest investment versus debt investment? We have not discussed that. Uh, how do we mobilize money for infrastructure? How do we mobilize money for the long term, etc.? We have not addressed that. The rules have not changed. We, not, nothing. That's my third element. It's more a malicious comment, but not that malicious on quantitative easing. Why never did we never discuss green quantitative easing? It would have been an interesting occasion to allocate part of the money channeled into uh, buying bonds specific to green. Why not? I know central bank, I have this conversation with Benoit actually, who is more open than you, Jean-Claude. I think it was worth discussing. I think it was worth discussing. Uh, and last on Germany, I'm from Can, I cannot help uh, intervening. But then you will have all, absolutely all, social uh, and uh, no, know, the highly praised investment that will come Yeah, but the you. difference is that, that, we, that we, we, I mean, uh, now with the US outside, everybody has signed on COP21. It's a global engagement signed by heads of state. Yeah. It's not. It's not a and kind of. Fight against inequality and better education for everybody. Yeah. You, I mean, you buy 100 billion of, of, of green bonds, etc. I mean, it's, it's at least worth discussing. I do that only to you. No, of course, but I think. It, I, I, yes, I said it was malicious, but I think to have at least this conversation would have been interesting, even to talk to the population, actually, not just to have this technical discussion between bankers. And my last point on, on, on Germany, uh, I love Germany, I come from Alsace, I have, I have really uh, considered Rhine not as a, for, uh, as a border, but as, as a way to cross, a passage, a bridge. My only concern when, when we discuss with German and when they, they add the high moral, uh, I do say, high, and the moral high ground in the conversation. It's not necessarily just rational, everything you discuss, but we are right because we are right. 
And, and that's, that's really where it's, it, it's, it's a little difficult. I mean, that's, again, I say that, I'm, I'm not, not participating to anything, I've left Europe six years ago, but I feel that every time I go to Germany, I presented my book a few weeks ago, and it was so, mag I mean, obvious in the room, I couldn't believe it. Thank you. Well, I, d I disagree also <laughs> with you on that point, but we, we, will, we will discuss that later. So thank you very much. We have still something like uh, 25 minutes, and I think that we have a lot of uh, discussion to take place. So I will interrupt uh, both, I would say, questioner and responders in order to be sure that we uh, are exploiting uh, our ideas. You have the floor, sir. Uh, I'm going to do this with great trepidation, <clears throat> but I want to build on something that Jeff introduced and Bernard took further. The way humans behave <clears throat> is to develop a set of heuristics and then apply them consistently until the system fails. And when we develop models for the purpose of modeling for simulations and related things, that's what we do once again. So simulations work brilliantly as long as the underlying assumptions associated with the simulation are effective and the moment those underlying conditions are no longer applicable, the simulation breaks down. That's how society functions too. <clears throat> That's why we have revolutions from time to time. There's a significant change in respect of social, economic, and technological circumstances, and the institutional response to it is inadequate. Jean-Claude has made the point, I think, wonderfully in the past, that in effect, the central bankers who had to grapple with the crisis in 2008 did not have textbooks, did not have recently published articles that they could easily refer to, and in effect, they had to make policy on the hoof. And that's why I guess we refer to it as unconventional monetary policy even today. But the fact of the matter is policy frequently has unintended consequences, and some of those are what we're grappling with in respect of both the unintended consequences of extreme liquidity on the one hand and the issues that we haven't addressed as a consequence of the crisis on the other. Now, there's nothing surprising about that. That's what human systems do. But I think what we're failing to recognize in a certain sense is the system around the technical system is broken. We're not getting the rise of people from Duterte to Trump, from Putin to Erdogan, from Bolsonaro to everything else, because of the fact that unconventional monetary policy produced too much liquidity in the system. We are getting that response because the level of trust within society and the political institutions and the economic manifestations of those institutions, including monetary policy, but it's a relatively small part of the whole, no longer are seen by significant segments of many populations as serving a purpose. Now that's the vulnerability, it seems to me, within which we will have to face the next financial crisis, great or small. And the potential for escalation in conditions where social cohesion has broken down dramatically, social polarization has increased highly significantly, trust in institutions has been appreciably reduced. It's going to be far more difficult to come up with technical solutions to technical problems under those particular circumstances. So unless we use this moment to drive that debate forward, what we are properly discussing in this workshop this afternoon is going to prove likely to be impossible. The trust that you could rely on, Jean-Claude, back when, in 2008, doesn't exist today. Bundeskanzler Merkel may not be the CDU leader in January of 2019. The Hessen result is probably going to cause a further loss of roughly 10% to the CDU. The Bavarian result produced a similar loss in respect to the CSU. And the pressure that exists in respect of all of the centrist parties 
in the European space, before you get to Russia, Turkey, the Philippines, and Brazil, the pressure that exists on those centrist parties, whence our norms come, whence that normative framework within which we are expected to deploy fiscal and monetary policy in order to bring about a restoration of stability is fracturing. And that, I think, is the most frightening element of the present moment. It's not something that too many people around this table can deal with directly, but I think it would be a serious mistake to imagine that technical instruments are going to be adequate to deal with the next crisis. No, you're absolutely right. I think there is a consensus to consider that populism, the new wave of populism, is something which is now the main challenge for all, I would say, political, uh, part, political parties, leaders, and so forth, everywhere, finally, including in a country which is succeeding admirably in terms of employment, in terms of, uh, of uh, cohesion of the society, at least uh, seen from the outside, and still the governmental parties are uh, vanishing. In my own country, it's a caricature. Uh, we, we have, uh, fortunately, it's not the extremists that are taking over, but it is the, a new centrist uh, that you know, is totally eliminating, and it's a real, real issue, the traditional right and the traditional left. So thank you very much, but uh, okay, we, we all agree that it's the problem, and of course it's a political problem, uh, which cannot have technical response, but the technicians have nevertheless to, to bring about the best possible solution, taking into account my, my own interpretation, but I don't want to monopolize the, the response, is that uh, we have this problem probably for the next 30 or 40 years, because it, the, the, I would say, most vulnerable part of the population in the advanced economy, the working class, uh, less educated than the best, uh, I would say, member of uh, part of the labor force, will have the competition of India, Brazil, Mexico, China, and the like, and Indonesia, and so forth, for the next 30 or 40 years. And until and the they post industrial revolution. Yeah, yeah, on, on, top, on top of that, plus the changes of values that they observe in society, which makes this anxiety gigantic because it's an economic uh, anxiety. It's, uh, I would say, obsolescence of uh, skills and it's also a change of value. So uh, I think we, we have to tell political uh, leaders uh, and uh, parties of all persuasion that they have a structural problem which is really gigantic uh, and they have to, to think uh, boldly uh, in this respect. And again, it's not for, uh, for us, unfortunately, to give the appropriate response. But um, I uh, think that maybe we could take two or three new uh, questions and then we could wrap up. Uh, let me take all the questionnaires. Yes, madame, you have the floor. Madame, you have the floor. The, oh, no, it's not you. It, yeah. you. Uh, you go, you're going to go? No, no, okay. the, the first is madame. Yes, thank you. And then you, and then do we have other questions? Uh, no? Two questions now, or remarks, or observations. Right. Well, I, I'll share my you observation, and I have a question. You um, have the floor. You, thank you for yeah. uh, bringing a discussion back to emerging market economy. And uh, Jean-Claude and Jean-Claude Bouillou um, uh, talked about the rising, uncomfortably rising levels of uh, debt, um, including and particularly in emerging market um, economies. What um, I worry about as a um, sovereign debt restructuring um, um, practitioner um, in particular is uh, the the quality of, of, of the debt and the components of, of such levels of debt and particular non Paris club bilateral indebtedness um, which is uh, kind of obscured at, at the moment but it will rise as a as a new problem uh, from my perspective um, just having been in that space for for over 20 years so how would non traditional bilateral creditors like China and India would respond uh, when um, their sovereign debtors cannot repay um, their loans and it will happen. They will not be able to repay their loans. So I see three options. One is negotiating um, ad hoc arrangements, uh, perhaps securing political or um, geopolitical concessions um, as a price um, of uh, forgiveness of such loan. Option two is uh, um, 
joining Paris Club, um, and uh, option three is forming a new club, such as uh, you know, a, say a Beijing Club of uh, non um, OECD uh, members. So far, um, for example, you know, China, um, the um, the, the, the major uh, principal lender in emerging market um, has dealt uh, you know, with uh, the situation using the first option, negotiating um, ad hoc arrangements. Um, just uh, earlier this year, and we, we t uh, touched briefly about it in the, in, uh, in, in the panels, you know, China secured 99% um, of, uh, of the major port in Sri Lanka, plus 15, um, thousand um, acres of adjacent land, a very strategic um, place, uh, piece, um, in uh, exchange for debt relief, for total debt relief uh, of uh, Sri Lanka as a sovereign. Would uh, um, Venezuela and Ecuador be the next uh, contenders in uh, you know, using the same, um, the same option? Um, I hope not. So, you know, what would uh, be, you know, the governance issue, um, you know, the governance solution uh, for that issue? So I will be thinking about that. I'm just curious what uh, panelists um, thought about that. Thank you very much, madam. It's a real question. You have the floor and then you, sir. Please, madam. Um, I was just going to try and go back to the real economy for a moment um, and talk a little bit about growth. So one of the things that concerned me a bit when I was in the Treasury Department was a putting out a, a number like 3% um, when you know your labor force is growing at 0.3 or 0.4, you're putting a huge amount of faith in productivity growth. Um, which is, of course, right, the key to long-term growth in per capita income and, and what we really, in a long-term sense, are all seeking. So I think my question is really, is there a role for finance in supporting, improving, fostering productivity growth? Has, or has finance been part of the problem? Um, so sometimes you hear um, the story that, you know, QE and uh, extraordinary liquidity has essentially propped up very low productivity firms for a very long time. It, we really haven't had this kind of creative destruction that we normally have um, during recessions, but this one was just so terrifying that we just had to put a floor in there and uh, a lot of people were supported. Um, you also hear, or I've heard, um, that because we're in a more IT and IP uh, intensive environment, some of that's a little bit harder to collateralize. And so financials are having a harder time lending to those firms or understanding the, the way in which to lend to those firms. So I'd just be curious from the people in the room whether you think finance is part of the problem and also part of the solution, if there are things that should be changing. Thank you very, very much indeed. So the last question, if I may, and then we will uh, try to wrap up. Please. Yeah, um, I come from Germany. <coughs> Therefore, it took me a while to, <laughs> you take, to take the courage you heard to a ask lot. my question. <laughs> yeah. um, there is no government policy to create a trade surplus. So what do you want the Germans to do? And I, I know Mr. Schäuble always uh, talks about the Schwabian housewife who only spends the money that you have previously earned. What do you want them to do? Okay. So uh, we maybe, uh, I will not make a, a tour de table uh, in order to, to be sure that those of us that have a response to bring about would, would do that. And we have a lot of new questions and observations, uh, and I, I reserve my right to, to respond also to some of them. <laughs> but uh, who wants to speak now? Jeff, have you? Uh, <laughs> no, there was a lot of questions which are of a political nature. Right. And, uh, well, I mean, <laughs> the simple one on the German front is fiscal policy. Um, fiscal policy, and then uh, the German government plays a role directly or indirectly in wage negotiations. Um, and and has has been I mean well it's been it's, it's been back and forth but I think the two things that have been pointed to the first is would would be undertaking a more expansionary fiscal policy and the second will be trying to encourage a loosening of some of the wage restraint that was so central in the early 2000s but is now no counter counterproductive I think um, I think that in many ways 
one of the most interesting, one of the most interesting questions is the one that was raised about what China will do when it ha when its debtors start going under. Um, we do have, as you say, the the Sri Lanka precedent, which is a is really a debt to equity conversion. You know, uh, in this case, the equity being <laughs> some pretty important, yeah, <laughs> 99 year lease on some pretty on some things which some people believe are, are centrally uh, important to, to Sri Lankan national security. Um, and since the amounts involved are very large relative to the country's economies, I think that it will raise a whole series of political questions. And China may well find itself in the crosshairs of some nationalist, it already has in Sri Lanka, but may find itself in the crosshairs of, of some pretty powerful nationalist sentiment, which might mean that it might want to join the Paris Club or talk with the fund about structured uh, re about that restructuring under the auspices of the fund. I think it would be foolish for the Chinese, I'm, this is not advice, but it, it is advice, but it's, it's free advice, so worth what it's paid for. Um, it would be foolish of the Chinese, I think, to maintain these things on a bilateral, bilateral basis because the history is that they always become politicized and always in a bad way for the creditor. Um, I think yours is the crucial question, if we only knew why productivity was slowing down, we could do something about that. Um, I do, I am struck by the fact that no one has addressed the, I, I wanna call it hypothesis, I think it's a fact, but the hypothesis that even today in many countries, especially in Europe, the credit channel is fundamentally restricted or not functioning fully. Um, there's a lot of evidence, we have bank, bank firm loan specific data for Portugal, for example, that shows that small and medium enter enterprises today still cannot raise all the funds that they need to, which goes back to the, the potential misallocation of resources even with zero interest rates. When the credit channel is impeded, that means that good projects don't get funded. Um, I think that actually is also true in the U.S., although not to the level of, of, um, of Europe because there were so many bad loans on the books and there's so much risk aversion in the private sector um, that good, good, good projects are not being funded. Um, so I don't have an answer, but I think that would be part of it, would be looking at the, the impedim, impediment, the impediments to the credit channel. Thank you very, very much indeed. You want to yeah. say a word, please? Uh, I just uh, may comment on yeah. just a possible role of finance to just to raise productivity and uh, growth. And it may be related to also the current account surplus problem. Now, looking at the Japanese case, uh, the so-called investment saving, saving investment difference divided by GDP is 5.5% in the last 10 years. <coughs> so which means just corporate sector, I'm interested in the corporate sector, corporate sector is act accumulating about 60% of GDP for the last 10 years. S they don't spend, they didn't spend. Now, in order to just uh, mobilize the economy from supply side, I think investment is very critical not only just for expansion of the capability, more important thing is how they can change business model under the innovation. So in the case of Japan, this is very important. So government tried to just to stimulate, just, to, just moving money, which is already there, which is not used <laughs> to the more active uh, action to the corporate sectors. Now, in German case, the saving investment difference or divided by GDP is something like 2.6%. So it may be better than us. I mean, you save less, but still, that part, if it can be used to just stimulate the economy uh, for supply side chain, that may be more collection of the current account. I don't know how the government policy can just uh, uh, move that, but uh, I, I think the anyway, save, saving investment uh, difference in corporate sector is very important. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, uh, yeah, please. Yeah, I'm going to address the, the debt, uh, debt issue uh, from a little bit broad um, uh, perspective. Um, I recall um, 40 years ago when China started to um, uh, open door or economic reform, they're also facing uh, the financing uh, issue. Uh, fortunately, that time I recall there's a the, um, uh, debt crisis in Latin America. So China f uh, facing you borrow money uh, abroad or you do uh, FTI, attract foreign direct investment. Mm -hmm. 
Fortunately, China is taking second uh, measurement, uh, which I think is successful. Also, I guess uh, I just read the, art, uh, the book um, called uh, 329 Days, uh, I guess wrote by the uh, personal ad advisor for former uh, Prime Minister Ko. Uh, the 329 Days called the collapse of the Berlin Wall to the unification of German. When I finished reading the book, I suddenly recognized why Soviet Union failed in some way, because I guess at the last, um, they make a phone call, call, call Gorbachev. They're talking about money, talking about how much money uh, uh, Western Germany to give the, the Soviet Union to get agreement from Soviet Union to have a unification of Germany. So in Soviet Union also get lots of uh, foreign uh, debt mm. to support their uh, uh, economic reform. True. So that's the issue. Also back to the current uh, situation, I guess still a developing country can do some regulation on private uh, borrowing, uh, overseas borrowing. Maybe that's not totally capital account uh, opening, but after the uh, global financial system, IMF will literally changing their position. Allow in some way capital control still in the part of the tool of a potential uh, management. So in that way, for example, currently China, if private company want to borrow money overseas, they have to get approved from Chinese government. That way China can control uh, the falling debt for private. Sovereign debt, of course, is a separate issue. It's relatively uh, can be controlled. Thank you very much indeed. So very rapidly, perhaps if you wish, uh, Bertrand and Daniel. Two, two, uh, two quick comments. First, I w I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but uh, I, I would really emphasize what you said. I said, if by any chance after for the next crisis, Odysseus and Hector came to a good technical solution, it would be a very hard sell. And that's, that I think, a big issue. And so I'm afraid we will repeat the curse of the war of Troy. That's uh, not to add to a positive note to this end. Second point, as finance being part of the problem, uh, just one, one, one element, if my memory is correct, the highest rate of finance in GDP in the US and UK was 1929 and 2007. So I think it was part of the problem. Uh, and now one of the issues after everything which has been put in place is that finance uh, is really echoing the lack of trust in the system. Again, I, I mentioned compliance, but uh, the bureaucracy, etc. So it takes much more time to do things. It's much more complex. It's a drain on the economy. And if I take a tiny bit, which where I spend a lot of time and I was at the World Bank, which is correspondent banking, it's below the radar, but it's just disappearing day after day after day. So it's basically the relationship between emerging and developing economies and the central system, which was handled by Citigroup, JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank. One after the other, they cut the ties. That will be a problem for the global economy, which is not visible yet, but someday it will surface, and then we have another problem and another backlash from the population. Uh, let's keep in mind uh, about China. China in particular has been um, behind, has been behind creating alternative arrangements to the Bretton Woods arrangements. It's happening in Asia and many countries have joined this. So I would use this as an analogy for, you, you said, the Beijing group. I don't know if it's going to be called, it could be Kuala Lumpur group, or it doesn't matter. It's going to happen. Clearly it's going to happen. And not, uh, they, we should not believe that the guys in, in Beijing do not understand, I mean, it's uh, the pitfalls. Okay. Now, secondly, about Germany. Uh, why Germany has to think about the policy stance? If Germany had had its own currency nowadays, I mean, it's, the euro is like an undervalued Deutsche Mark. When it comes to competitiveness and the industrial strength of the German economy, I mean, it's a, uh, Germany would have experience with a much stronger currency, a lot more unemployment. So, so, so this is something people should understand, and, is, and it's the task of politicians in Germany to explain it, however unpalatable it is, is for German citizens. Last but not least, about finance. 
it may be that there is a lot which is wrong with finance. And, and finance is not like a bakery. Finance has a particular role to play. It could, it could argue that finance has many of the attributes of public utilities. So if, if, if finance is frozen nowadays, when it comes to reshaping, it's redirecting its funding of activities, so on, so on. Now, in Germany, there's the Kredit für Wiederaubau. We're talking nowadays in Europe about promoting promotional banks. I think we should, we should set up a range of banks with the backing of the, of the governments. We should fund new, new industries. Otherwise, we're going to be stuck. There is so much risk aversion, I mean, there is so much fear, then there should be something you go, yes, this is government intervention. This, I mean, give me a break. <coughs> I mean, it's like a Kriegswirtschaft. I mean, it's a, and, and there are promotional banks in Europe, in Germany, in Austria, even France. I mean, the, 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 the French government is behind, I mean, banks. So we should not fear it. I mean, it, it is such an extraordinary set of circumstances, and we should be bold. So I would not fear setting up, even in, in the United States there is talk about setting up such a public finance institution. Why not? What, what, what's wrong with this? I think it, it, if we are blinded by ideology, we're going to, to continue to go in the wrong direction. We should be pragmatic. Thank you. Uh, in the US, you have Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, which are semi-public institutions, are uh, taking a lot of risk and are preventing the banks, the commercial banks, from taking a lot of risks that are taken in Europe by the banks themselves. So we, we are in a very complex situation as regards the financing of the economy on both sides of the Atlantic. If I may uh, try to wrap up, first of all, we had a very good discussion, obviously, a lot of interaction. Uh, I cannot help uh, saying a word on, on Germany. Uh, the problem of Germany is really twofold. One is the very big current account surplus, which is signaling something which is not absolutely uh, normal. That being said, I uh, share the view of Wolfgang uh, when he says, but, but uh, what do you want me to do, finally? I don't commend the industry and the entrepreneurs. I don't commend the unions. They have their own deal. All what we could do is to encourage the union to be more demanding, which was done by the German government and by the president of the Bundesbank. 